questions, please use the questions box and type them out. Our speakers will be monitoring those and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Uh, also, we'll be recording this for the folks who are not able to participate tonight so they can view later. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Lucille Davey, a great friend of ours at the Hunt Institute, who's going to talk about the new assessments and how we how we're, we arrived where we're at. Thanks so much. Um, so I am Lucille Davey, as she just said. I um, Just a little background about myself before I begin. I spent about four and a half years as the Commissioner uh, of Education for the State of New Jersey. Prior to that, I served as an Education Policy Counselor to two governors in New Jersey. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in mathematics, and I've taught math at both the high school and college level. I'm also a lawyer by training and practice law um, for some time in between. And um, I would say, however, that the most important role that I've ever had was that of parents. Uh, my husband and I have two sons. And uh, while they were in school, they're both uh, you know, out of college and, and in the job and labor market now. But while they were in school, um, we were very attentive. And I was a very active parent and a very involved parent. And I, I think that um, it's, a, it's a really important time uh, today, especially for parents to be engaged to seek information and to ask questions and to find out as much as they can. It was how I learned a great deal um, about education. And uh, it was how I advocated not only for our children, but also um, for all children as, as they were growing up uh, to have great educational opportunities that would prepare them for the future. So if we can begin, I want to talk a little bit about um, why we actually need new assessments. Um, on, the, on the next slide, you'll see uh, I'm actually um, you know, talking at first about why, why are these tests changing? Why, why are you going to receive different score reports? Why are you hearing different things about the kind of tests that your students and your children are now, are now taking? And that's um, primarily because we've, we've learned some things about the tests we were administering to students. We, we gave them primarily multiple choice tests. And those questions, those kind of questions where the child gets four or five answers from which he or, she, he or she chooses, the correct answer really allows them to guess. And they can get the right answer. And then we might really not know whether or not they, they know um, the skill that's related to that question. In addition, it's really hard to assess critical thinking skills and problem solving skills in a multiple choice question. They're just not best designed to measure those kind of skills that we know are critical uh, for young people today, especially um, in, the, in the labor market. Um, we also want to be able to measure the way students can, uh, what they understand, and whether or not they can actually demonstrate to us the evidence behind their answer or, or the work behind the calculation or the answer um, that they've provided. And uh, you know, multiple choice questions don't give us the opportunity to have students give us that evidence. So these new tests really allow for children to show why they chose the answer they've chosen, why they believe you know, that, um, that this is the answer to the math problem, or why they believe this is the answer to a, a reading comprehension question, so that we really know whether or not they've understood what they've read or the way they've done the mathematics. Um, the new assessments use, very in a very exciting way, technology. and you know, switch from pencil and paper test, um, which is a good thing, though, because it really does uh, provide us with a step forward. It allows for different kinds of item types. A lot more can be done on a, on a computer uh, or a digital-based platform than you can do on a simple printed paper and pencil test. Um, it, it also means that students are going to need to use technology more in their classrooms for learning, because if that's how they're being tested, um, you know, the schools will know they've got to be using that, that technology for learning as well. And of course, we need these new assessments because there are higher expectations for students, um, particularly for the workforce, but also for college. Too many students leave high school unprepared. They get to high school and they're told that they have to do what's called remedial or developmental coursework because they haven't mastered the skills in K-12 that they need to succeed in college credit-bearing coursework. And so we need tests that measure more closely the skills that they need to be successful um, when they enter college in the workforce. So I want to move on now and just talk a little bit quickly about um, the standards and the changes to the standards that really 
um, are driving these new tests. So in the English language arts area, uh, students are now reading literature as well as nonfiction or what they call informational text. And our old tests, the lots of the prior state tests, were basically literature based. And they didn't have a lot of nonfiction on them. And yet we know that when students go to college, they read a lot of nonfiction. They're not reading literature um, you know, in science classes or in economics classes. So it's important for them to be uh, exposed to nonfiction tests, texts from very young ages, and for us to measure how well they're progressing in their comprehension, their vocabulary development, and their writing skills. Um, in addition, the standards are now very clear about the fact that we need to make sure that students are reading increasingly more difficult te texts as they move from kindergarten up, to, up through grade 12. And the, the new tests will make sure that those te texts that appear on the tests are increasingly complex as the students go through the grades. I mentioned a minute ago, minute ago the need to develop writing skills. And these tests now will be measuring writing in other content areas. Again, not just answering a question about a piece of literature or a piece of poetry, but in addition to that, uh, being able to write an essay based upon something you've read that might be science-based or history or social studies-based. In addition, in the ELA standards, there are requirements that children find evidence in text and actually show that evidence so that we know that they truly do comprehend and they haven't just taken a very good guess. Um, you know, as I talked about text complexity, I had this little cartoon, which is one of my favorites. Um, texts are getting increasingly more complex, but they are grade level appropriate, and that's important to remember. I, I, I don't want you to think that um, we're asking kids to read things well beyond what's appropriate for their grade level. It says we disagreed on whether first graders could handle Shakespeare, so we're doing Green Eggs and Hamlet. Um, it's kind of, kind of funny they're not reading Hamlet, certainly, in first grade. They're still reading Dr. Seuss and all those other wonderful stories. Um, but as they go through the grades, there does need to be attention to increasing complexity. Now, on the next slide, I have a couple of resources, and we'll share these with you, um, that might address ELA concerns that you might have or that you might hear. Uh, the first is a blog from a teacher where she talks about the fact that these standards are developmentally appropriate, the ELA for students. So if you've got concerns and if people are saying to you, I don't think that you know our children can handle these standards, I think they're too, too hard for them, too difficult, they, they challenge them too much, take a look at, at, um, at the teacher Al D. Alfonso's blog. As well, there's a great piece from Robert Condicio on the edexcellence.net uh, website. No time to lose on early reading, really, where he really makes the case, and he's an expert on early literacy, he really makes the case about why these standards are not too difficult and why we really do need to begin um, helping children get those early reading skills from kindergarten right through first grade and, and so on up. Now we'll move to, next to the math standards. Um, a couple of major changes in the math standards, and these again are some of the reasons why the tests are also going to be different. So at the elementary grades in particular, there are fewer topics at each grade level that are covered. Students are no longer doing probability and early statistics work in those elementary grades. And that means they can spend more time on learning about whole numbers, learning about operations on whole numbers, so addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, the properties and the operations and the, and the ways that you can apply those whole number uh, calculations to everyday problems. Then students build up to fractions and then they build to decimals. But they do this in a progression that makes sense, that allows them to master first whole numbers before they learn about fractions. They master fractions before they move into decimals. And it's, it's really important what we've learned and what we've seen from countries around the globe whose students perform the best is that focus in those early elementary grades is a hallmark of what those other countries do. They ask teachers to teach less topics, but to teach those topics more deeply so that students develop a strong foundation. Then, with a strong foundation, they can uh, build to increasingly more complex skills in mathematics, which sets them up for success in algebra and for success in high school and beyond. 
what we hear high school and college teachers in particular, math teachers say, is that students come to them with a weak foundation in the basics. And so these standards really do allow students to master the, the arithmetic skills that are so critical because they are the foundation for the much more complex math that follows. I want to make um, a point, though. This second bullet is a really important one. You know, there were these math wars back in the 90s when our children were in the elementary grades um, where people said you, you should do one or the other. Either children should just memorize all the math facts and, and memorize all the algorithms, the ways to do multiplication, you know, three-digit multiplication, just memorize the steps, and then keep doing that over and over and over. And then there was another school of thought that said, you know, um, they need to understand what they're doing. It's not important if they know the math facts. As long as they can think mathematically and feel good about the mathematics they're learning. What these standards say is we need a balance in the middle. Neither end of the spectrum is right. We need to have children who can compute fluently and, and understand how to compute and know their math facts. But at the same time, they need to understand the mathematics behind it. Because as the math becomes increasingly complex, um, it, it's very difficult for them if they have no foundation and no understanding of the mathematics behind it. The standards ask students to apply what they've learned to real-world problems, and these new tests are giving them real-world problems that they can tackle and show how they can apply the math that they've learned. There are different pathways in high school. Um, you can have a traditional path, what many of us took, Algebra 1, Geometry, and then some kind of Algebra 2 course. Um, or there's also another pathway called integrated math where they bring together the algebra one and the geometry and also the data and statistics which are embedded in the high school standards which need to be uh, embedded into the traditional pathway courses as well. You've got to do some of this in your algebra one and your, and your geometry and your algebra two course because so many young people today need to use statistics in the real world. That's what so many jobs rely upon. Many of these jobs being created today, particularly in the tech areas, um, you know, it's the kind of thing that Google and Facebook and others use all the time. They're, they're using statistics and they're manipulating data and, and analyzing data on a regular basis. So it's really important um, that students develop those statistic skills. They're in the standards at the high school, primarily at the high school level, and it's important for students to get that while they're in high school. Then a little cartoon about um, Little boy saying, I'm trying to avoid algebra. I heard it's the gateway math way. Math algebra is the open the opening. It's the open doorway to all the math that follows. It's important, as I said, for children to have a foundation to be able to succeed in algebra so that they can succeed in the mathematics that follows. On the next slide, I've got a few resources to address math concerns that you may hear, that you may have, or that you may hear other parents have. Um, and there's links here to the videos that the Hunt Institute produced with the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics to help parents understand how math teaching and learning is, has changed, why homework might look different, um, why it's important to have focus in those elementary grades. I strongly recommend this series of videos. Uh, most of them are six or seven minutes long. I think one of them might be uh, 10 minutes, but they're, they're divided up by grades. If you go to that link on the website, at nctm.org, um, there are little blurbs and, and links to each of them. So I highly recommend those. Now let's talk about how these assessments are changing and what this means um, for your students. So that were formed uh, by, by several of the states, um, groups of states in each case. And you know, one of the real hallmarks of those consortia is that items were developed by teachers. And uh, I think that's really, really important because in the past, most of the state tests were produced by vendors. And they, they basically created those tests with their own staff. And there was very little input from educators, from teachers, into not only developing the items, but reviewing them and giving input and, and really saying why they were you know, good enough items or, or not acceptable. And, and I think that's a real strength of these new tests. We know that we've got standards that have more rigorous expectations, as I mentioned earlier, that help address the need for students to be ready for college and career. We need to measure them differently, as I said earlier. And so these assessments are changing to reflect, reflect that. 
one of the ways that we best do this is to have more open-ended questions, more open response items, as well as performance tasks. And these items frequently um, require, in the, in the case of performance tasks, students to do some research, to read more than um, one piece of information, to solve a problem that's complex and based on a single theme or a scenario. And it, it's usually, the performance test is usually something that you can't just do in, in 10 minutes or even one class period. It may take two class periods to do. But they're rich problems, they're rich tasks that allow children to really show us what they've learned, what they understand, and how they can take what they've learned and apply it to a real world problem. And that's exciting because it's really engaging for students. When you ask children um, what they like best about these new tests, one of the, the key things that comes back from them is they love these challenging performance tasks. They're much more engaging. They're much more interesting for them to do. I think um, you know the next point about an assessment system is, is an important one to make because what we really want from assessments is an opportunity to change instruction, to reflect or to modify that instruction to reflect how students are performing and where they might have skill deficiencies that need to be addressed. So it's important to have a system of assessments and not just that end of year test so that teachers know all along the way how students are doing and where they might need to change their instruction or where they might need to supplement instruction for children who are having difficulty or whose skills are not strong enough yet in a particular area. So those systems are being created connected to these new assessments and it's a major strength, I think, of the work that the two consortia have done. The last point is one that I think is important to make because um, Many of you, I think, will see if you if you don't have results yet, you'll you will soon, and you will see that you know the results are are not as rosy. They don't look as good as they as they looked in the past. And you know, I can tell you this as a former commissioner under NCLB, the goal was um, that every child was supposed to be proficient on the state test by 2014. And you know, candidly, lots of states figured out in in not. Uh, you know, not too much time, that it's a lot easier to help every child become proficient if the expectation for proficiency is lower. So as an example, when I became the commissioner in New Jersey, you could be deemed proficient on our state test if you earned as few as, a, as one third of the points on the state test. You could be defined, you could be labeled proficient. And of course, when I saw that, I was really, really troubled um, because in, in my mind, if we were testing what children really needed to know and we really wanted them to learn, then getting only one-third of the answers right would be a signal to me that they really hadn't mastered the skills at that grade level. Now that's an important if because it's important that the test be aligned and that you're measuring what you really believe and you've, you've told teachers that children need to learn at that grade level. So we need to pay attention to the alignment of items, but we've also got to be more honest and recognize that getting 30 or 40% of the, of the answers right or of the points on a test, earning only 30 or 40% is not sufficient. Children can't move on. Um, we can't allow them to, to move on with confidence that they've mastered the skills at a grade level if they've only earned you know, 33 or, or 35 or 40% of the points assuming we have a test that's aligned to our standards. In the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about the impact of changes um, to these new assessments. And you know, these are some of the issues that you may hear parents talking about, concerns about the fact that more time is being spent on testing. Well, you know, let's be honest, right at the outset, the performance tasks, which we know are more engaging for students, um, are more complex than, than just a single question and they take more time. If you're going to give a child a rich performance test that really allows him or her to do some thinking and some reading or some research and to, and to do some problem solving and then some writing, that's going to take more time than just answering a single multiple choice item. And, and we've got to be honest about that and recognize, you know, do we want our children to take on those kinds of problems, those, those tasks 
that really ask them to think deeply and show us what they've learned? Um, and is that trade-off of maybe an hour more on testing worth um, the time that it takes? I would argue strongly that it does. Um, you know, using technology for testing, especially in this early stage, this transition um, to testing, uh, may, may take some doing because uh, we don't have a student, one-to-one uh, -one student to device uh, system in place yet in schools across the country. And so some planning is required to figure out how do we get all of our children not only time uh, to take the test on a digital device or a computer or a tablet, but also time to do some learning and to have some instruction on those devices as well. So that's, you know, that's something that, that's been certainly an impact by the transition to uh, assessments that are digital based. One of the other real benefits, I think, is the opportunity to give students partial credit. When you have these open-ended tasks, these longer performance tasks, they often have multiple parts, and I'm going to show a couple of examples in a minute. Um, it, it gives students an opportunity to show us what they can do, but it also means they can earn points um, for what they can do and not just get a right or wrong answer. You know, when I taught mathematics at high school and, and at the college level, um, I, I saw many times where students could do all of the thinking, all of the problem solving, the really difficult mathematics, and then they would make a silly arithmetic mistake or they would, you know, transpose two digits of their answer when they wrote the answer on the, on the answer sheet or something. And um, so I always made them show their work so that I could see, had they learned the mathematics or not? And you know, if you just look at the answer, you can't always tell that. And I always gave lots of credit to students, um, particularly as they went through the work that they showed me. For example, if they make a silly mistake in the first or second step, and then they get all the math reasoning right after that, but because they made an arithmetic error or a calculation error early on, and that carries through, um, you know, they get the wrong answer. You, you want to give them credit if they really understand the mathematics. So there's a great opportunity to do that here. And um, you know, finally, I just want to say on this that these tests are not likely to be perfect in year one. This is a big transition, moving to online assessments and moving to tests with open-ended items and you know, performance tasks. And so there's some growing pains. That's all to be expected. I've got a quick example of a rigorous ELA test to show you on the next slide. Um, this shows you an example of it's a Smarter Balance sample writing test. You know, students read, read text that involve several arguments and that uh, to support the use of cell phones in school and then some others that have arguments that why cell phone usage should be forbidden in school. And then they're asked, based upon what you read, do you think cell phones should be allowed? And then you have to use the information in the text to write a paragraph to argue your position. So, you know, there's no right or wrong answer here. The idea is use the evidence that you read and support your position and articulate that in a good piece of writing. That's a rigorous test. You can't do that, you know, in five minutes and that takes more time. Um, the next slide is an example of a rigorous math problem. This is a complex problem and this is a good example of the kind of problems that are now on the consortia test. There's 28 cookies on the plate, five children ate one each, two ate three each, one ate five, the rest ate two, the plate's empty, how many ate two cookies? Well, this is complex. There's lots of steps in this. Show your work. So this gives children an opportunity to really show us their thinking mathematically. And um, clearly, you know, you can tell if they understand the mathematics or maybe they make an arithmetic mistake that you can see. And they'll get partial credit depending on how much of this problem they can answer. Now let's move on and talk a little bit about the Smarter Balance Assessments because I know many of you have children in Smarter Balance states that, that administer those tests. First point, these tests were created by a group of states who work together voluntarily. They chose to come together and create these tests. As I mentioned earlier, there has been, there's been lots of input from teachers in those states. They have been involved in item development right from day one. I provided a list of the states that administered um, the SBAC test in 2015. One of the uh, high, high points, I guess, of their tests is that their tests are computer adaptive, which means that each question that a student answers then helps determine the next question that the student is given on the computer. 
It allows uh, a student to be assessed with fewer items, and it allows uh, us to zero in a lot better on exactly where the child is on the performance continuum at, you know, pretty much at the grade level. So you can tell if a child has, um, you, don't, you don't keep requiring a child to do um, lower end problems if they show that they can do more difficult work. Similarly, if they're at the lower end of the spectrum, there's an opportunity to zero in and find out exactly where their weaknesses and where their strengths are so that the teacher knows um, where they might have skills that need to be um, worked on. They also offer an assessment system with interim tests, practice tests, and instructional tools and resources. And I think that's a really important point. I talked about that earlier. I have on the next slide a sample of a Smarter Balanced Score Report. Um, this is hard to see on the slide, uh, um, uh, but this is the kind of thing that, that parents will receive. What I will tell you is there's much more information in this slide, and this one is just for the, um, the top end for the ELA and then the bottom half for the mathematics. Lots more information for parents. It shows the different levels of performance. Um, it breaks down the skills in math, concepts, and procedures, problem solving and data analysis, communicating their reasoning. In ELA, the reading, the writing, the listening, and the research and inquiry, you'll find out how your child is performing each of those areas. And you'll find out if the child is in level one, level two, level three, or level four. And that will tell you how well they've mastered the skill at the grade level. On the next slide, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the park assessments. Again, created voluntarily by a group of states, again, with input from teachers in developing the items. The states that I listed are the ones that gave the test in 2015. Some of those states are not going to give the test um, in the future, a few of them. Um, there are accommodations for children with IEPs. And you know that's applicable to the uh, Smarter Balance test as well. Uh, students can enlarge the print. They can change the color. Students who have IP requirements can have the questions read to them or the text read to them, depending on what their IEP says. PARC also provides practice test instructional tools um, for grades 3 through 11. And that helps teachers by giving them sample items and practice tests that they can use with children throughout the year so that not only can the teachers um, get information about how students are progressing during the school year, it also means that children can be exposed to what those items that they're going to see on the end of year state test look like um, during the school year. They actually get a little bit of practice and exposure to those kinds of items. And that's true of Smarter Balance as well. On the next slide, I've got a sample PARC report. This one looks a little bit different than the Smarter Balance report. This one is only for ELA. There's a second page for mathematics. Um, but the same idea, you're, you'll find out which level from one to five. They've got five levels on PARC, where your student is performing. And then there are um, different areas like literary, literary text, informational text, vocabulary, writing expression, knowledge and use of language. So that's um, connected a lot to writing and grammar. You'll find out whether your child is below expectations, nearly meeting them, or meeting or exceeding expectations in each of these areas. All of this information will give you an opportunity to have a better conversation with your child's teacher about how he or she is performing. Um, on the next slide, I have some resources for parents. And you're going to hear more about this from the other folks on the call, so I'm not going to go into this. Um, just some links there, and you'll get these um, these links after the call is over. Um, on the next slide, I just want to say briefly, some of you may be from states where they're not using either Smarter Balance or PARC, but they're using a test that the state is developing on its own, or they may be using the ACT Aspire test in grades three through eight, and then using the ACT's typical college entrance test for high school students. Um, these tests are all supposed to be aligned to the standards as well. Some states are purchasing items from PARC or Smarter Balance, and they're creating their own state exam. Uh, that might mean that your child isn't getting performance tests or open-ended questions. It saves time and it saves money, although as I said earlier, I think those are some of the greatest strengths of the um, new test. Just quickly, I want to um, finish with some final thoughts um, on this next slide. The proficiency benchmarks um, are likely changing. I mentioned it earlier, but it's important to remember it doesn't mean that your child isn't making progress. 
These are not apples-to-apples -apples comparisons with prior tests that your children have taken in prior years or that your older child may have taken when they were at the same grade level. These are really different assessments. And it's really important as parents for you to remember that. Look at this as a new starting point. This is a new benchmark. And what you want to look at is how your child is progressing from here going forward. The other really important point that I want to em emphasize, and this is critical, is that the child's um, test results on this end of year state test is only one measure of his or her achievement. Should you be concerned if they haven't done well? Yes, you should be. Should you ask questions of your child's teacher? Absolutely. Should you want more information about how they're doing? Yes. But keep it, you know, as one measure. The child may have had a bad experience on the school bus on the way to school that morning, or something else might have happened. You know, maybe they didn't eat a good breakfast that day and they were hungry. Who knows? Could have been any one of a number of things. It is one measure. You want to look at everything that your child does during the school year to decide whether or not your child is making the kind of progress that he or she needs to make. This is a good measure, but it is only one measure. I think that, um, you know, I can't emphasize enough, you need to talk to your child's teacher. You need to ask the child's teacher, you know, what do these test results mean? How will they impact my child? Does it, does it mean something about their placement, you know, at the next grade level? What classes they can take and those kind of things? Your child's teacher and your school principal are two of the best resources you can have. And so um, really be willing to go and ask them the questions. If there's anything they can't answer, they know how to go and find the answers, and, and they will absolutely help you with this. Um, these results have come back pretty late this year. In the future years, they will be available sooner. Parks just set their standards for proficiency during the summer, and that's why their results are rolling out um, so much later. My, my last request is that you get involved as parents at the district and state level to influence policy decisions. You need to make your voices heard. You should um, be knowledgeable about testing. You should really be firm that you want high quality tests. You want tests that are aligned to what your students are supposed to be learning, what your children are supposed to be learning. And you want tests that truly measure the skills that they need later in life. And if you demand that as parents, that's what schools um, will produce. That's what your state will do. Um, when they know that they have consumers who are educated and who are demanding, they will respond accordingly. Thank you so much, and I think we'll take questions. Thank you so much, Lucille. We're gonna we got a lot of great questions coming in, and we are gonna address these all. But we want to give our next speakers a chance to review some really great parent resources. So uh, next up, we have Bill Jackson from Great Schools. She's gonna talk about some of the great resources that their organization organization has for parents. Oh, thank you both. And to confirm, can you hear me? Yes. I'm switching over the screen to you. Great. And I've just accepted that. And hopefully you can see my screen now. Yep. Great. Thanks. So um, I will stick within the 10 minutes here. Um, uh, Lucille, thank you very much for the, um, the, the background and the context for all of this, which I I also have kids, um, and they are now a sophomore in high school and an eighth grader in, in middle school, and um, so live this from the point of view of as the, the CEO of great schools and, and also as a parent. Um, never, there's never a more important job than being a parent and navigating the changes that are happening in education and you know, this moment in time of, of receiving the test scores. Um, is, is one of those um, seminal moments in, the, in a transition happening in education towards what um, I certainly see um, and we at great schools see as positive change where um, teaching and curriculum is becoming more stimulating, um, tapping higher level skills that in fact are the kinds of skills that our, our kids will need in the future. Um, so what we have done at great schools is to create a uh, what we hope is a simple and accessible resource for our parents um, in the SBAC and Park states primarily. Um, it could be used by parents in other states, 
um, but it's primarily designed for the SBAC and PARC states. So I, I want to spend my team here, time here showing it to you um, and encouraging you to check it out for yourself. It, you see this URL right here. Um, it's actually statetestguide.org. So again, statetestguide.org um, is the URL that will bring you there. And feel free to go there now um, and follow along or explore as I talk. Um, and we will send follow-up email to all of you to have that information. Um, so here's how it works. Um, I'm in California, so I'm going to select California as my state. Um, and I'm actually going to choose, while I have an eighth grader, I'm going to choose fifth grade, kind of in the, somewhere in the middle here for the demo. Um, and uh, then go into this, this state test guide. Now, you, the, the California is a um, smarter balance state. Um, we're now in the California state test guide. Um, and uh, there is, uh, as you saw from the score report that Lucille showed, results come in, in for both ELA and math. We're in fifth grade. Um, I'm going to flip over to math here. Um, and the state test guide for parents is built around the specific areas that you receive scores for your child. Um, and in, in the case of the Smarter Balance test, that's concepts and procedures problem solving, et cetera, there, and communicating reasoning. For a park, it's different. And if you were to have chosen, if you had chosen a park state, a park version of this tool launches, you will see the areas that park has, which, is, which are different. So I'm actually going to go into problem solving and modeling data, and data analysis, because this is some of the newer stuff that is featured on the um, on the new generation of tests more so than the older generation. Um, the state test guide, every section in both ELA and math is divided into two parts, what it means and how to help. So what it means, um, you can see this, the kind of um, uh, information we have here. Um, so th this, you know, th this we're trying to do is for fifth grade or problem solving um, what does it really mean? So here are as an example of what it really means in fifth grade is estimating answers. So for example, if you, you know, and we've all probably experienced this in, in, our, our, um, in our own lives, like you come up with some solution through computation that isn't even remotely possibly correct. Well, fifth graders are at the point where they're supposed to be able to kind of gut check something. Um, and that's what in fact, they're being tested on, that kind of thing, in addition to some of these other, other items here. We embed videos that demonstrate kids, uh, that show kids demonstrating the skills that are being tested at each of the grade levels. Um, so these are fifth grade, this is a fifth grader estimating the answer to a word problem. Um, those videos are a valuable resource here. Then if your child didn't meet the problem solving and mo modeling data analysis standard, here are the most likely reasons. Um, I'll get to how this was created in a, in a moment. Um, I know I just got a few minutes, so I want to be fast here. Then, optionally, we have sample problems for you. So if you want to see how the Smarter Balanced or Park Test assess your fifth graders uh, problem solving skills, here are the kinds of problems that were used. And I, I'm just going to go fast here so you can get, kind of get a sense of the, of the types of problems. Um, by the way, you see these are all thin because this whole tool is optimized for use on a mobile phone as well as on a computer. So if I go here, you can see this whole experience um, is also uh, equally good on a mobile device. Um, so back into problem solving and modeling data analysis for fifth grade. Um, I can then click over on how to help. So there are always in math four sections of, um, of how to help. Start with a great attitude. Um, I won't go into that, but super important. Um, sprinkle math into everyday activities. This is my favorite personally. Um, so it, this gives you lots of advice about or suggestions on how to sprinkle um, activities that fit into your daily life that relate to these tested domains. Um, 
You know, number two here is a great example. You're ordering pizza for seven people. A medium pizza costs twelve fifty and has eight slices. You want everybody to have enough pizza for three slices. How many medium pizzas do you need to order and how much it will cost? If while you're ordering pizza, you can sprinkle those kinds of questions to your child and, and get some love back, <laughs> um, that's really helpful um, to your child's development in math in fifth grade. Boost those skills. Um, these are um, th these are suggestions um, from our teacher experts that we work with uh, about the best online resources that relate that are most related to this grade level and this particular aspect of math. And then finally, there's always a suggestion about talking to your child's teacher, um, and we try to make that a little bit specific to the tested domain. Um, so uh, let me wrap up in in the next two minutes here. Um, we are gonna, we'll send you a, uh, a PowerPoint, um, a link to a PowerPoint. It's actually a Google Docs thing which goes through um, a little de the demo basically I just gave you and then at the end has some important points about um, how, the, uh, uh, the, the, how, it, how it works. So it, it's free to everybody, um, covers grades three through eight, not yet 11, um, that'll be coming later. Um, it's in Spanish. The whole experience is in Spanish as well as in English. If I'm here um, in, this, in this page and I want to look at everything in Spanish, I just click there and the, you got the whole thing. Um, so we'll go back to English. Um, and uh, the park version comes in November. Um, we have some of these funders here. Um, and we're working with David who's presenting next um, and his team on uh, on, on how we do this. Learning Heroes is, is a terrific resource for us as well as we design and, and develop this resource. Um, finally, how we do, who we talk to as we created this so you can have uh, trust and confidence. Um, in addition to experts who uh, were involved in the creation and directly work for uh, SBAC and, and Smarter Balanced, we work with uh, te 10 teachers closely across the Smarter Balance states thus far, and there'll be about another 10 across park states who've helped us go deep. Um, and, you know, as you see these, to just jump into concepts as procedures, how to help, you know, what are the best activities that relate to each of the skills um, and tested areas that parents could engage with their child, particularly these kind of everyday activities. Um, those teachers were really extremely valuable in helping us find our way on all this. Um, so with any Follow-up questions. I'd love. I'd love follow-up. We have the last slide of the slide deck that we'll forward the link to you on. Um, has my contact information, um, and we'll welcome any questions or feedback you have about the tool, and hope that um, you'll be able to pass this on um, to uh, parents in in um, in your schools. And um, I hope it's useful. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much, Bill. We really appreciate it. Such a great resource for parents. Um, we're going to switch over to David Park, who's from Be a Learning Hero. They are also uh, they also have a fabulous website for parents to browse around to get support on the assessments and the standards. So, um, David, I'm switching over to you. Great, thank you very much, Crystal. Um, and it's it's really exciting to be part of this, and I'm glad to be participating specifically with uh, with Bill from Great Schools and with Lucille, uh, both of whom I have tons of respect for. Uh, I have spent a lot of time on the uh, Great Kids uh, State Test Guide for Parents, and it is a fantastic tool. Uh, so I, I really hope you you check that out and you use it. Um, you can you can get really parents can get as much information as they want or as little as, as they want uh, depending on, in, on what they're looking for. And, and the math videos that Lucille mentioned earlier also I would uh, strongly encourage you to take a look at uh, because they're really terrific videos. Um, but my name is David Park. I am the EVP of Strategy and Communications at Learning Heroes. I joined Learning Heroes in February of this year after uh, working for about seven years at America's Promise Alliance, which is a national PTA partner. Um, and at America's Promise, I helped launch and 
implement the Grad Nation campaign uh, to increase graduation rates to about 90%. Uh, to 90% by 2020. So I have been in the education and youth services uh, world uh, for a while, and this is really amazing work, and it's just such a critical time in education right now. Um, I, I am going to um, try and move uh, relatively quickly because I, I want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, but basically, I'm going to turn, tell you a little bit about Learning Heroes and, and specifically some tools that uh, we're developing um, for, for parents. Um, some of you may know Learning Heroes. We work really closely with the national PT, PTA as well as state PTAs across the country. Um, but our mission is simple. It's to inform and empower parents of school-aged children uh, in grades 3 through 8 um, whose active role in their child's learning will help them succeed in school. So we're not about advocacy or policy or anything like that. And there are a lot of great organizations that are doing that. We're really about providing uh, trusted and honest information uh, to parents. Um, everything we do seeks to address three fundamental questions that parents ask. Why are these changes happening now? What do all these changes mean for my child? And, and most important, how can I help my child succeed? And that's really what Learning Heroes is all about. Um, this slide looks a lot more complicated than it is. It's really just talking about the, uh, the channels that we use to reach uh, parents throughout the country. One is online, and our website is bealearninghero.org. If you haven't uh, logged on to our website, I encourage you to do so. We collect uh, and, um, and, and um, create materials and resources and tools and information um, on, the, on Be a Learning Hero, so you don't have to go to a lot of different sites to get the information that you're looking for. Um, so bealearninghero.org is, is one way that we reach parents. We also have partnerships with the media organizations such as Univision uh, and, and also uh, CBS Sports and others so that we're really kind of showing what a great education looks like through the media. Uh, we do in-person events and, and we've done a lot of events with, with state PTAs um, and we feel that direct to parent uh, meetings are, are very important in order to give information, especially about the assessments and the score reports. And we also work directly uh, through the schools, uh, through teachers and through uh, school administrators uh, to provide information to parents. In August, we launched a public service uh, partnership, which was the first of its kind. Um, our core partner in this was the, the National PTA. We also worked with Scholastic and Great Schools and some of the others that you see at the bottom of this slide. Um, and this was all about helping parents understand what they need um, to help support their kids, um, given all the changes in the classroom. Um, so it's really a back-to-school campaign for parents. And as part of that, we developed this tool, which is called the Super 5. And the Super 5 is all about tips and tools uh, that parents can use and um, as their child goes back to school. And I'll talk just a little bit more about it in just a second. Um, but this is a, a resource that's on our site. It's one that uh, we did both with the National PTA as well as Scholastic. Uh, we printed out 1.7 million um, copies, and we sent them to schools around the country so that they could go home in the backpack channel with kids. Um, the Super 5 was really the centerpiece of a big media relations campaign that we did. A lot of uh, state PTA leaders uh, were trained as spokespeople um, to do media in their, their local communities. And we also did some national media with Laura Bay, um, as you know, the, the head of the national PTA. And we were really excited about the Good Morning America piece that uh, ran in September. And I'm sure a lot of you probably saw it. But it talked about homework help and the importance of homework help given all the changes in the classroom and how to use BeALearningHero.org uh, to help your child with their homework. We got uh, over 237 million earned media impressions to date. We're still doing a lot of media. Um, and so that's one way that we really use to, um, to reach parents across the country at this critical time. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of, of tools now real quickly. Um, one is the, the Super 5, um, which I mentioned before. Um, and this is on our website. You um, go on, you'll see on the home page there's the Super 5. And we did this in partnership with the PTA and Scholastic. And here you have um, tips. And this first one is find out your child's learning goal for his or her new grade. And so here this is all about what your child's learning this year. Parents need to know that in order to help their child succeed in the new year. 
Um, and there's, there's t uh, here below, there are several tools that you can click on um, that will help you find more information um, to, to help you know, understand exactly what your child is going to be learning in the new year. Um, the second one is understand your child's potential and know where your child needs to ex is excelling and where there's room to grow. And this is really all about uh, the new state tests and what the test scores mean for your child and where you can find tools to support your child's uh, learning. So right here underneath is the Great Kids State Test Guide for Parents and you can link directly to it. Um, you can also link to, to other resources for both Park and Smarter Balanced um, in the links below. Um, then this is all about getting involved with your school and your teacher and your principal, um, embracing char character and resilience, and finally bring it home. Um, all about homework help and there's some great tools and resources um, that you can click on to help um, you help your child with, uh, with his or her homework. Um, I'm going to try and get back to my, here we go, um, PowerPoint here. And so the second tool that I wanted to show you is the Skill Builder. And so basically, um, the, we have been working with an organization called uh, Raise the Bar. And about a year and a half ago, our partners at Raise the Bar uh, launched an academic adventure game for kids in math and English uh, for grades three through eight. And um, when the student completed the game, the parent got a report uh, that details how the child did against the major standard areas. And with each standard area comes a set of links to online activities designed to give kids the opportunity to practice. So if a child answers a fraction question incorrectly, parents can help the child link to practice activities to, and help strengthen their fraction skills. Um, with parents now receiving score reports that tell them how their child is doing against the standards, we partnered to leverage the resources raised the bar at already had to, to build a tool to help kids um, and help parents um, support their kids with these new tests. So if you go on to be a learning hero, this is actually the Smarter Balance page. We also have a, a card page. On the left, you'll see the Great Kids State Guide uh, Test Guide for Parents, and on the right, you'll see the Skill Builder. So if you click on, on Skill Builder, you basically have a, a search engine here. So you put the state, I'm going to put Nevada, you put the grade level, and I'll put grade four. I'll say the subject is math, and um, let's show problem solving and modeling uh, data analysis is the category, and you click on get results. And there's 30 results that are specific uh, to the information that I put in there. And if you, if you notice, these are tools and activities that um, you can use with your, your children. And so each of them have a category, whether it's above standard, below standard, or at standard, um, so that you can click on a tool or activity that's most appropriate for your child. And so you can go in and select the one that you think is most appropriate for your child. And these are really great games and activities and tools that can, can help you and help your child um, be more prepared in the areas um, where they may need some help uh, based on the, the new tests. Um, so that's it, um, and I hope you will visit BeALearningHero.org, and I look forward to talking to you again. Um, so I guess, Crystal, do you want to open it up for questions? Yep, I have some really great questions that came in. Um, let me start with some of the ones back with Lucille, but anybody can answer. Uh, somebody asked about the effective date for the new standards, so if you want to address briefly how states adopted and how states are implementing the standards? Uh, I'll take that real quick. This is Lucille. So states adopted the standards independently, many of them in 2010, some in early 2011, but the implementation of those standards was done differently by each of the states. Some started implementing right away, some only implemented at the elementary grades and then moved up, some started with math and then added ELA and vice versa. Some started with grades, um, you know, kindergarten one, two, and, and then also grade six and grade nine. It was done differently. It was a state uh, decision. But by now, every state is fully implementing through all the grades. But it, but it has happened 
over a very different um, uh, set of uh, timing, and, and so it really does differ state by state. Thank you so much. Uh, another question was, what do you think a realistic timeline would be to evaluate the test? If they're not going to be perfect in this first year, when can we expect them to be significantly improved? I'll answer that real quick. Um, I think you have to give it a couple years. You certainly want at least two or three years of data to make comparisons. And you know the movement to technology-based assessments, a few states have done this in the past administered their, their tests on, uh, on technology-based platforms. And you know I think they, they, when they did it, had growing pains. And it takes a year or two for everyone to get used to that. I, I think by the third year, certainly, people should be a lot more comfortable with the system. Um, and I, I think that's, that's true of the test, too. The more um, students get exposed to these assessment tools, the digital tools that are available, connected to Park and Smarter Balance, more teachers can use those sample performance tests and practice tests in the classroom as part of their teaching and learning. By the way, these are not tests that you really can practice for. You can't really practice for performance tasks except by doing other performance tasks because they're all going to be different. Kids are not going to see anything the same. You know, you're not going to see the same thing twice. Uh, great. And speaking of technology, Lucia, one of the questions that came in was how can we, how can schools be able to afford the technology required? A lot of schools are strapped for cash, reducing their budget. Uh, how can we make sure that schools have what they need to take to home? You know, I think that's a great question. And frankly, that's another place where I think parents need to advocate. Every school district is spending a pretty significant amount of money per pupil. You can buy a, um, you know, a, a small tablet or a, a small device for students, an iPad or something, um, for a few hundred dollars. And if you assume they have a three-year useful life, and you, you know, take that over three years, the cost of a of a device is probably less than the cost of a new textbook. And so I think this is a question of prioritizing technology in a school budget and in the spending. And I think it's a place where parents need to speak up. Candidly, the idea that you know schools haven't already done this is, is really one that, that concerns me because it seems to me that in the world of work, um, you know, people are using technology in pretty much everything that they do. And our children use a lot of technology at home in some way, even if it's an iPhone or a a smartphone of some kind. And so we, we really need to be thinking about how schools prioritize having the technology and making those investments and making the technology available. Um, you know, this is one of the things where maybe you can ask business in your community to help partner to help make this happen. Um, but I think it's got to be a priority, and I think it's a place where parents can speak up and advocate. Great. Thank you. So I think one more for you, and then I do want to give one to uh, Bill and David, another good one about the website. But Lucille, how can we ensure that the essay type questions are graded fairly? Um, great question. So the open-ended questions have rubrics, and that means there's a, a design, a very clear expectation laid out for what students need to include and what the writing needs to look like. And those are developed by teachers. That isn't just whoever grades the test decides what it looks like. But rather, you know, a group of fifth grade teachers sit down together, they look at the item, and they say, um, here's what a student who's meeting expectations will have included in that essay. And it's very specific. And, um, you know, Crystal, I can probably get you a sample rubric that we can attach um, to the, to the resources so parents can see what those look like. They're, they're, they're laid out very specifically with what's expected in the kind of writing style, you know, the, the kind of grammar and spelling, et cetera, and then the content. And so it's not just hit or miss. The, you know, every child gets graded against us. Every child who takes the test gets graded against that same rubric. And, and so you really do have an element of fairness. Um, and when the tests are scored, 
Um, if, if individuals are scoring these, let's say, you know, I'm scoring 2,000 of them and you're scoring 2,000 of them, somebody is checking a sampling of each of our scores to make sure that we're being true to the rubric and that the, um, the scores are consistent with what's expected. So parents can feel confident that those scores accurately reflect the work the child has done. Great, thank you. Um, and just briefly before I pitch one more question to David and Bill, uh, all of this information will be online at ppa.org slash assessments within a week, the recorded presentation as well as the slides and other information. Um, and David and Bill, I did have a question about your websites for those states that aren't using Park and Smarter Balance. Can you talk a little bit how the information is still useful for parents, even if they aren't necessarily taking a Park or Smarter Balance test? Uh, sure, I'll start and, and let you know that on Be a Learning Hero, there is, aside from the skill builder, there's also another tool that we have called Learning Tools. And Learning Tools is the same type of thing where it's a search engine and you can put your state in there and get tools that are specific to your state, even if it's not a Smarter Balanced or a Park state. One other thing I wanted to mention quickly is, and I, I meant to mention this before, is that we're working very closely uh, with uh, with Bill and great great schools, and we're actually going to be integrating the two tools that we talked about. So we're putting the, the skill builder as it is now is going to be included in uh, the Great Kids State Test Guide. So it'll be easier easy for parents to find all of this information by going to the the Great Kids tool. Um, thanks, David, and I'll add that. Um, while the organizing of the state test guide is by the categories that Park and Smarter, Smarter Balance use, um, the underlying content applies. Um, so uh, the the way that your state, if you're in, you know, let's say you're in in, in Florida, which has a different test, um, you can still go into um, right now the SBAC version and get a lot of uh, thoughts and, um, and, and and you know ideas about how to support your your kids and I think over, over time we're looking for a better solution to figure out how to address states that um, are not either park or SBAC. Great. Thank you. And Lucille, there was a follow-up question about the rubrics. Do the teachers get training on these rubrics? Um, I'm assuming they're referring to the teachers in the classrooms. The teachers um, have access to what these rubrics look like. And so, and, and I believe that there are also sample answers that will show, and that's the link that I'm going to try to provide to you so you can include it with the materials that you make available for parents. So the teachers who are scoring the test absolutely get trained in, in the rubric. But teachers in the classroom who might be teaching students um, you know, during the, the school year will also have access to the rubrics and what sample answers look like that meet um, each of the different levels so that when students take practice tests and um, you know, maybe performance tasks, teachers can do their own evaluation. It's certainly a great way for teachers to learn, um, you know, as well, what's expected of students on these end of uh, year exams. Great. Thank you so much. We're a few minutes over here, and we want to be respectful of everyone's time in their evening. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up. And again, the information here that you see on your screen will all be emailed out tomorrow, and all the information that you saw here tonight, including the full recording, will be available online within a week at pta.org slash assessment. Thank you all so much for attending, and a, and a huge thank you again to our speakers. We really appreciate the information that you shared with us tonight. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Good night, everybody. Bye.